Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Hope everyone's enjoying the holiday season and the, the crispy December weather in the high desert with like 1% humidity. I think I go through a quart of hand lotion a day because of the lack of humidity. But anyway, uh, it's our joy to be able to study through the passage that Pastor Daniel read earlier in Acts chapter 24. And uh, let me just remind you of the context. Way back in uh, chapter 21, we found the Apostle Paul being arrested in the temple in Jerusalem. And remember that he was there because um, he wanted to be present for the festival of, of Pentecost. And the leadership in the church in Jerusalem thought that that would be a good opportunity for Paul to build some bridges with the Jews because uh, it sounded to them, and maybe they were twisting what Paul was preaching, but it sounded to them that uh, Paul was against Judaism, against the law, against the traditions of the Jews. And so by him taking part uh, in a Nazarite vow, on the occasion of the Feast of Pentecost, uh, they felt like Paul could build some bridges. So he uh, did that. He went into the temple, and their plan fell apart. So rather than building bridges, the, there were Jews that went down to Jerusalem from Asia, from, from Ephesus, where Paul had been previously. They stirred up the crowds. Paul gets arrested. And ever since then, we've been following Paul basically under arrest. First in the temple area, he ends up addressing the people. Then he's brought before a Roman tribune in Jerusalem uh, and before the Sanhedrin, the council. And uh, in chapter 24 here, we find Paul before uh, the governor of the area, Felix, in Caesarea. And Pastor Daniel last time covered the... Um, section in Luke's narrative where um, Paul was being transported under guard to uh, Caesarea um, in order to meet with Governor Felix. So that's where we pick up the, the narrative. This is Paul's trial before Governor Felix in Caesarea. And uh, there's two main things that we see here in Verses 1 through 21, first we see uh, Tertullus's accusation against Paul, and then we're going to see Paul's defense in verses 10 through 21. We're going to move kind of quickly, I trust, through the text, but then at the end I want to go back and reflect on some uh, applications that we should take away. So let's begin. First of all, we'll look at Tertullus's accusation against Paul. Paul, and that's in verses 1 through 9. So in verse 1, again, we read, And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. So this is the entourage from uh, the Sanhedrin, basically, from Jerusalem, representing the, the temple. You can think of it as a dream team. Ananias was the high priest, there was a representation of the elders from the Sanhedrin. And then there's this, this lawyer, Tert Tertullus. We don't know if he was a Jew himself or if he was a lawyer hired by the Sanhedrin, but he was certainly good at what he did. He was skilled in Roman law. And uh, he was there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to prosecute the case against the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so in verse 2, and when he had been summoned, that is Paul, he was under arrest, when he had been summoned and brought into the trial, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you, now he's, now he's addressing Felix, Governor Felix, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, 
reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. We'll, we'll stop there for a minute. Pastor Daniel mentioned uh, how I was going to take this, and I believe that this is nothing more than flattery. I think that when Paul addresses Felix, it's, it's uh, respectful for his office, but I believe that what Tertullus, or, uh, Tertullus is doing here is flattering Felix, trying to win his favor. And the reason for that is just think about these uh, various words here. So, most excellent Felix. It certainly could be a term of respect, but Felix himself, this is Antonius Felix, as history knows him, he was actually born a Roman slave. And he's the only uh, Roman governor who ascended to that position after being a slave. So it's, it's quite a background. He gained his freedom as a child through the influence of his brother with the, um, the emperor of, of Rome. And then he basically lived a career of uh, political intrigue and uh, sleight of hand and deal making, the, the kind of thing that we imagine in Washington, D.C. maybe when deals are made behind closed doors. And that was Felix's life as he progressively rose in status to eventually become the first former slave to be a governor of a Roman province. But his background as a former slave made him cruel rather than merciful. You would think, I suppose, that if there was somebody who uh, had risen through the ranks like that, had been redeemed from being a slave, he'd be, he'd be humble and merciful, but, but not Felix. So the Roman historian Tacitus wrote this about Felix. He wrote that he was a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. In other words, with, with bitterness. He indulged in every license and excess, thinking that he could do any evil act with impunity. So that was Tacitus, a, uh, a peer or um, a contemporary of Felix. And then John Stott, the New Testament commentator, wrote this about Felix. In reality, remember that uh, Tertullus had said to Felix, uh, since through you we enjoy much peace, uh, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made and in every way and everywhere. Uh, we, the Jews, accept this with all gratitude. And John Stott says, in reality, Felix had put down several insurrections with such barbarous brutality that he earned for himself the horror, not the thanks of the Jewish population. So this is just a lie what uh, Tertullus is saying here, and he's lying for a purpose. It's the purpose of, bri of uh, flattery, and he's flattering in order to win favor so that his case would go well. In fact, in, in one instance, according to Roman history, Felix ordered a massacre of thousands of Jews in this very city in Caesarea, with many more Jewish homes looted by the Roman soldiers. So once again, I believe, and the commentators I've used agree that this was utter and complete flattery. And flattery, just as a reminder, is a sin. Flattery is a sin condemned in the Bible. So, for example, Proverbs 26 and verse 28, a lying tongue hates its victim and a flattering mouth works ruin. You see the parallel there? A, a flattering mouth is in the same category as a lying tongue. Flattery is basically saying lies about someone in order to gain that person's favor. So uh, favorable lies. And that's exactly 
uh, what Tertullus was doing here. And then in Proverbs 29 and verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. And that's a, another indication from the scriptures that uh, flattery is not sincere, but flattery has a hidden agenda, a selfish agenda. And so a flatterer may, uh, might say glowing, super friendly lies to his neighbor, but really uh, in the course of that flattering, the flatterer himself is spreading a net for his, for his neighbor's feet. He's not desiring the benefit of his neighbor. He's trying to take advantage of his neighbor and he's using flattery to do that. So flattery is a sin because it's not true and it's selfish. The flatterer has an agenda in mind, a selfish agenda. And the Apostle Paul picks up on this strain in Romans chapter 16 and verse 18 where he writes about people who cause divisions in the church. And he says, For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. And, and once again, we could see the motivation here in Romans 16, 18 of flattery. It doesn't come from selfless motives. It doesn't come from a motive of wanting to be a blessing to one's neighbor. It comes from a motive of wanting to deceive the hearts of the naive. And it's interesting that Paul would write that because here's Paul on the other end in Caesarea listening to this lawyer representing the Sanhedrin flatter um, Felix, the Roman governor. But to tell us, it turns out, was just getting started. This flattery towards Felix was just his introduction, his opening statement, uh, as it were. Then he comes to his real target, Paul. So notice verses 4 through 8. But, Felix, to, de to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man, Paul, a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. So Tertullus moves on from flattery to just rank false accusations against the Apostle Paul. These accusations were utterly false. And we know that because we've been reading the story. We've been reading the historical narrative from Luke's pen. None of this is true. Um, Paul was not one stirring up riots among the Jews. It's true that wherever Paul was and he preached the gospel, often there were Jews who came, uh, came onto the scene and stirred up riots because the, the gospel that Paul was preaching made them mad. And they didn't like it and they wanted to silence him. But he, that wasn't his purpose. He was not trying to stir up uh, riots. He didn't directly or intentionally do that. And their terminology here, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, it's basically a way of them calling him a cult leader, a heretic of the Jews. And uh, they said that he tried to profane the temple. And we know that that's not true. He went into the temple in order to participate in this Nazarite vow on the day of, um, or through the festival of, of Pentecost. He wasn't there to profane the temple, and he didn't profane the temple. They're all false accusations, but they're very dangerous because every one of them, every one of them opened up Paul to the death penalty within the Roman Empire. 
So he was accused of being an insurrectionist, which obviously the Roman Empire did not take kindly to, um, a heretic, and uh, part of the, um, the truce, if you will, between the Roman Empire and the Jews in Palestine was that the, the Jews were able to handle cases of heresy themselves. And so the fact that he was being accused of being a heretic would open Paul up to the death penalty at the hands of the Jews with a blessing, or at least a blind eye, with respect to the Roman government. And a profaner of the Jewish temple, same thing. So false accusations, not innocent, not harmless, very dangerous. So here is this man, Tertullus, uh, trying to uh, accuse and prosecute Paul to the end that Paul would be put to death. And it's a reminder of why the Ten Commandments contain the Ninth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. It's interesting that when the Ten Commandments, which, as you'll remember, uh, is, is a summary of all that is right and righteous and holy in terms of human behavior. It's a summary. When the Ten Commandments uh, address the sanctity of truth, it doesn't just say, you shall not lie, although lying is included. And lying goes on to be outlawed in the law of Moses but instead, it's directed at our relationships with other people. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So it's not just don't lie in the abstract, but certainly and especially don't lie with respect to what you say and what, what you represent about other people because it's destructive to your neighbor. It can ruin their reputation. You could be guilty of gossip. And in a case like the Apostle Paul's, it could actually lead to their death. And then later on in Exodus, Exodus chapter 23 and verse 7, God says in the Mosaic law, keep far from a false charge. Don't play with it. Don't come as close to it as you possibly can, but keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And Tertullus and this dream team from the Sanhedrin, they were 180% or degrees in violation of this command. They were staring this prohibition from God in the face and violating it just open-faced in terms of bearing false witness against Paul, bringing a false charge against Paul, precisely because they wanted Paul killed. So, Tertullus' accusation against Paul. Now we move on and see in the second place, Paul's defense in verses 10 through 21. Paul's defense. Notice verse 10. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. That's interesting. Co contrast Paul's address of respect and appropriate respect to Felix with all of the flattery and going way beyond uh, accuracy and, and balance from Tertullus. There's no flattery. There's no fawning. And don't you hate that? When, when people fawn leaders as if they can do no wrong and they ignore elephants in the room and all of the rest. There's none of that from the Apostle Paul. 
no stretching of the truth, no manipulation, just truth and respect. And he began to answer the charges brought against him. Verse 11, you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And what Paul is basically saying there is there's all kinds of eyewitnesses. Um, there are eyewitnesses who would be available if they would actually seek them out. And those witnesses would verify that Paul had not been on the ground long enough to be planning an insurrection. It just doesn't fit. Wasn't there long enough. And he wasn't there in Jerusalem uh, to stir up a riot, but he was there sincerely to worship in Jerusalem. He was, after all, a Pharisee himself. He was a Jewish religious leader himself. And in verse 12, when he was arrested, he says, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. That's a very clever statement to make because there Paul is in the presence of his accusers and he says to them, when they arrested me, I, I wasn't doing the very things that they were accusing me of. When they arrested me, I wasn't stirring up a riot. I, I wasn't arguing with anyone. I was just there to worship. And he goes on to say, I, I wasn't guilty of stirring up riots or uh, stirring up dissension, either in the temple or in the synagogue, in any of the synagogues or in the city of Jerusalem. That's not why he was there. That's not what he was doing. And he challenged his accusers to their face and they couldn't respond. It was actually a very powerful defense. In fact, maybe you'll remember uh, from chapter 21 that it certainly wasn't Paul creating riots and stirring up the crowds. It was actually uh, the Jews themselves. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 27, when Paul arrived in the temple, we, we read this. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, so that was near Ephesus, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. So there, there, there was something of a riot there was a scene taking place in the temple, but it wasn't caused by Paul. It was caused by those who were on the same team, as it were, as Paul's accusers. Paul was an innocent man. Back to verse 13. So Paul continues a statement, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city, neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. That was a very bold statement. Prove it, he says to his accusers. Prove it. And they couldn't. And they didn't. Then he shifts, shifts gears in his defense. So, the facts on the ground did not match the accusation. But then also, what Paul was all about, what he was preaching, also didn't fit with their accusation. Remember, they accused him of being a sect leader, a cult leader. So he says in verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect. I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. That's a very big statement. Paul is basically saying, we're not just some offshoot from Judaism. I believe every single word Paul said that was ever written in the Law and the Prophets, I believe every single statement made in the Old Testament Scriptures, 
And it's because I believe the Old Testament scriptures that I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It's because of the Old Testament scriptures that I'm preaching the gospel that I'm preaching. That's why we read a number of times in the book of Acts that the textbook that the apostles preached from, Peter and James and John and, of course, the Apostle Paul, their textbook for preaching was the Old Testament scriptures. They, they uh, persuaded people from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so this was an opportune moment for Paul to make that point. And it's a reminder, by the way, of um, the claim of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, on the road to Emmaus when he was walking with a couple of disciples. Uh, Luke says about the occasion that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's shorthand for referring to the whole Old Testament, with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then later on, just before he gave the great commission to his disciples in Luke 24 and verse 44, um, Jesus said this, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus reminded them that he had come in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets, and everything concerning him from the Old Testament scriptures must be fulfilled, including his death and resurrection. And then that's why Paul, this man who was under or on trial on this occasion, when he wrote his letter to the, to the Romans, wrote this in Romans 3 and verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. That's Romans 3.21. So there, Paul is explaining to his readers that the gospel that he was laying out to them, explaining to them in the book of Romans, is not some new thing. It's the very gospel that the law and the prophets bore witness to. So it's a reminder to us that we believe and worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. We believe and worship the God of the Old Testament. We believe that the Old Testament predicts the coming and ministry and death and resurrection and ultimate return of Jesus Christ. We believe that the gospel is contained in the Old Testament. It was the um, uh, early church le leader Augustine who said that the new covenant is in the old concealed and the, and the old is in the new revealed. It's one book containing one story. It's a story of redemption and it shall be accomplished. This is what God is doing. Uh, and just to add to that point, we're told that we Gentile believers are also sons of Jacob. And we are the offspring of Abraham, not by blood, but by virtue of our faith. So it's a very big statement that uh, the Apostle Paul made here in verse 14 in his defense. And imagine, by the way, imagine how that statement in verse 14 must have gotten under the skin of the Sanhedrin. If they would have been all alone in a dark alley with the same people present, they probably would have skinned him alive. They would have stoned him, no doubt, by saying what he did in verse 14. But he, he took advantage of the fact that he's under arrest, he's on trial in, in a Roman setting, and therefore protected 
from his accusers. And so he says this really bold statement. Notice verses 15 and 16 as Paul's defense continues. Having a hope in God, the same, he had the same hope as a Christian that the genuine believers in the Old Testament had, which these men themselves accept. So uh, these men preached, professed faith in the hope of the Old Testament. That's the very hope that Paul was, was preaching. And what's the content of that hope? that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. We're going to come back to that. So, Paul says in verse 16, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. He said, it is my conviction, it is my purpose, it is my commitment, it is what my life is all about to practice what I preach which would for, forbid me from doing the very things that I am being accused of. And you'll notice that Paul focuses here on the resurrection, the general resurrection of the living and the dead, the, the just and the unjust. And that was his motivation in life. Then he concludes his defense in verses 17 through 20 by saying this, now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present, present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation. He should be confronted by eyewitnesses should they have anything against me. Or else... Let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. And we, can, we read about that when Paul made that statement in chapter 23 and verse 6. So here Paul not a trained lawyer, nevertheless made a very skilled defense of, of himself against these false accusations, and Paul unraveled the case against him. They had no specific evidence, no eyewitnesses who would testify that they saw Paul doing the things that they were accusing him of. So, their case unraveled. So, that brings us to the end of the text, but I do want to reflect on some takeaways. I think there are some very important lessons here that we should take with us into Monday. And the first takeaway is that as people of the truth, we must uphold the sanctity of truth. Why do I call us people of the truth? Well, because the God of the Bible, the God whom we worship, is the one true and living God. And he's the source of all truth. And by the way, that's why it's a sin to lie. That's why it's a sin to bear false, false witness against your neighbor because it's a contradiction against the character of God who is the truth. And that's why when you're operating outside of a Christian worldview or even more generally a Judeo-Christian worldview, and let's say you're an atheist or you're a, you're a materialist, you have no consistent, absolute reason to say it is always wrong to lie. The truth is absolutely good. You have no reason to say that. But a Christian does because we're people of the truth. 
And not only is the God of the Bible the true and living God, and he is the truth, but Jesus, our Savior, is the way, the truth, and the life. And so as Christians, we should be committed to the truth. We should be committed to the sanctity of truth. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 15, this same Apostle Paul would write, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. We should be striving and growing and progressing in Christ-likeness. And one very important measure of that is speaking the truth in love. Becoming more and more faithful to the truth even as Jesus is the truth. And by the way, we speak the truth in love. We don't speak the truth in order to deceive and manipulate and, and hurt to achieve our own selfish ambition, but we speak the truth in love. And then in verse 25, Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Paul says, Therefore, having put away falsehood in the Christian life, uh, there's always this dynamic of putting off the old, putting off sin, and putting on the new, putting on Christ-likeness. So having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why? For we are members one of another. We're, we're in union with each other in the body of Christ. And one great way to break apart the church is to engage in lies, not tell the truth. And then look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice how this commitment to truth impacted the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul wrote in this context, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you, uh, coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, and now we can see in Acts chapter 24, Paul could have added to his list, in Jerusalem and Caesarea, but it was also shamefully treated at Philippi. And as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error. Our, our message does not come from things that are just wrong, untrue not factual, or impurity. In other words, impure motives, the kind of motives that would lead someone to bear false witness against his neighbor or to flatter. N none of that. That's not where our message came from. It didn't spring from this. Or any attempt to deceive. When Paul preached the gospel, he was a straight shooter. He told it like it was. There were no tricks. It was not a shell game. There was not, we're going to tell you what sounds good now, and then later on, we're going to let you in to the real stuff. Nothing like that. Nothing hidden. No deception. But, verse 4 just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And that's a great description of our, situ of our calling, our stewardship as Christians. It is not up to us to make up the message. It is not up to us to modernize the message. It's not up to us to improve the message so that it's a little bit more palatable to postmodern ears. No, we have been entrusted with the gospel. 
It's the gospel that has come to us through the scriptures, the faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints to us. God's entrusted that with us, and it's our job to proclaim that gospel. And then Paul says, we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And so he says, so we speak. In other words, that, that's, all, that's all we're saying. Just 16 ounces to the pound, 100% pure, biblical, from God, gospel. No mixtures. Nothing to dilute. And we do this we want to see people saved. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.22, I've become all things to all men that I might by any means save some. But don't mistake uh, Paul's flexibility with things that he can be flexible with. Don't mistake that with being a man pleaser because he says not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. And ultimately, ultimately, brothers, that's our motivation. We proclaim the truth of the gospel. We share the truth of the gospel. We speak up for God's truth wherever, in all contexts, all settings. And at the end of the day, we're going to be called dumb, old-fashioned, bigoted, biased, blah, haters, whatever. Let God be true and every man a liar. Paul says, I'm not trying to please man, I'm trying to please God, and God knows our hearts. And then finally in verse 5, for we never came with words of flattery. <laughs> he wasn't like Robert Schuller. Do you remember Robert Schuller, the founder of the Crystal Cathedral? who um, his, his theology and the way that he talked to people was characterized by flattery, basically. And I, and I think Joel Osteen today follows in, his, in Robert Schuller's footsteps. Wouldn't dare offend anyone. Doesn't want to talk about sin. Doesn't want to talk about repentance. Certainly doesn't want to talk about hell. Doesn't want to talk about the things that our society are calling good, that God calls evil, but instead, you're, you're such good people. You're wonderful. You're, you're little gods, in the case of Robert Schuller, or you are here and God wants you to have your best life now, in the case of Joel Osteen, whatever. Words of flattery. Do you hear that? Those are words of flattery. That is not what Paul preached. He didn't flatter people. He, he, he didn't puff them up so that he could gain followers. He told them the truth in love. He feared God and not men. And ultimately, it was actually for uh, love of his fellow man because they needed to hear the truth so that they would repent of their sins and come to Jesus. Then he finishes verse 5. Uh, so we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. It wasn't after the money. He asked for money. There's several times in the New Testament where Paul is asking churches for money, but it was not for his flesh. It was not a pretext for greed. And, and he appeals to God as his witness. God is witness. So, this is the example set for us by the Apostle Paul. No flattery, no manipulation, no hidden agendas, just the truth. In love, but the truth. And we need to follow that example. And without going too far down the road of politics, uh, we just came off of what I think has been the most divisive presidential campaign in my lifetime, I think. And no side is immune from flattery and false accusations and exaggeration and stretching things. And all I'll say is that may we not think 
because of our political persuasions, may we not think that that's okay. May we not think that because that's how our guy, whichever one, uh, ran his political campaign and whatever, 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 that that's how we're going to act in the church or that's how we're going to act as, as believers. No, we need to uphold the sanctity of truth because we're people of truth. Then a second takeaway. As believers, we're called to be peacemakers, not rioters. Paul is a great example. Paul was falsely accused of stirring up riots, of being an insurrectionist, and if found guilty of that charge, he would have been put to death. And then Paul ends up defending himself very specifically by saying, nope, not true. That's not what I was in Jerusalem for. You have no witnesses that can say that that's what I was doing. In fact, it, it was a crowd of, uh, another crowd of Jews that stirred up the riots in Jerusalem on the occasion of, of Pentecost. Paul was not only innocent based on the facts of the case, but he was innocent because rioting, stirring up crowds, stirring up hate and discontent and dissension, it's contradictory to the spirit of Christianity. That's not what our religion teaches. Jesus, who's our Lord and Savior, taught in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek. And meek means tame, calm, peaceable, reasonable. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The writer of the book of Hebrews uses peacemaking as a barometer for holiness. In Hebrews 12 and verse 14, the New Testament says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see that? That parallel? Strive for peace with, uh, with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So peacemaking in Hebrews 12, 14 is representative of holiness in that particular case. And let that command sink in. Strive for peace with everyone. Not just people that you like. Not just people who are nice to you. Not just people of your political persuasion or your theological persuasion. Not just people who drive like you. Not just to people who fill in the blanks. But strive for peace with everyone. Everyone. Without exception. Sometimes it's not possible. And the Apostle Paul recognizes that in Romans 12 and verse 18 when he writes, as much as depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Sometimes, like Paul, he could not be at peace with the Sanhedrin, right? He tried, it was a false accusation. But uh, sometimes we can't bring about peace, but that should be our goal. That's what we should strive for. That's what we should make. We should be peacemakers. And then look with me in James, James chapter 3. And I'm going to back up a little bit. Start in verse 13. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his, word, his works in the meekness of wisdom. By the way, this is the meekness that Jesus talks about in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be, and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A great description of peacemaker and its opposite. All right, and then thirdly and finally, takeaways. The resurrection of all people is a central part of the Christian message. It's so interesting that uh, that's what Paul ends up appealing to in his defense before Felix. It's the resurrection from the dead. And in chapter 24, uh, when he appeals to this in verse 16, in verse 15, he, he appeals to a resurrection of both the just and the, and the unjust. And he says in verse 16, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. In other words, Paul says, I am living in light of the resurrection that I preach. And we're, we're out of time, so you can look up these verses on your own, but I would like to mention one to you uh, because it's also in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 through 32, we, we were there not too long ago. The apostle Paul was on Mars Hill preaching to a group of Athenian philosophers, and at the end of his message, here's his, here's takeaway. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. How, how do you like that for a gospel appeal? Repent because there's judgment coming. And that's the grand finale of the Christian message. Part and parcel with the Christian message is not a threat, not a fear tactic, but a statement of truth in love that there is coming a day when God is going to judge all people, the living and the dead. In fact, in the Apostles' Creed, it says that Jesus is coming from heaven to judge the living and the dead. And this final judgment will happen at the resurrection when both the just and the unjust are going to be raised from the dead. And those who believe in Jesus Christ are going to be welcomed into the, uh, an, an eternal existence on the new earth because their sins have been forgiven, they have been justified through faith in Christ, and their own uh, confession of faith in Christ will be vindicated by their lives. And on the other hand, those who don't know Christ will be condemned because their sins will show that they are unrighteous, sinful, wicked, evil from the heart out to their lives. And then they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever Well, they will, 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 they will suffer eternal, conscious, physical torment forever, eternally. That, how do you like that? But that's what the Bible says. And so if you're not a believer, I won't even add to that. But that's why we invite you to come to Jesus. And that's why Jesus is so special to us. 
That's why we as believers are so thankful to be saved. And that's why we want to share the message of salvation with you because Jesus has rescued us. And now that we live as Christians, we live in light of that day because we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to be faithful to Jesus for as long as I have breath until the Lord comes. So may God use his word to encourage his people and to, to bring sinners to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being with the Apostle Paul on this occasion, but thank you for the gospel that you entrusted Paul to preach. Thank you for the gospel that we as your people believe. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us to live in light of the second coming of Christ, to live in light of the, the judgment that Christ will carry out of the living and the dead on the last day. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to save sinners in our midst even today. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.